Thank you for being here this evening, and welcome to this event featuring the remarkable Sally Denton, who the late Senator Lee Reed, Senator Harry Reed, praised as having literary accomplishments to match anyone in the history of the state of Nevada with the exception of Mark Twain. <laughs> I might add, however, that Mark Twain didn't have to brave mobsters or drug runners or feuds between violent polygamous groups. And Sally has done that, and she's still doing that. I am Dorothy Alred Solomon. I'm a BMI fellow uh, working on my PhD in creative writing. And I'm proud to say I'm a friend of Sally Denton. And I'm so honored to be here with all of you. On behalf of Black Mountain Institute, I want to thank the Rogers Foundation and the College of Liberal Arts. I'd like you to take a moment now to silence your cell phones if you haven't done that already. As tonight, Sally will read and launch um, a discussion about her most recent work, The Colony, Faith and Blood in a Promised Land. She will then be available to sign copies of her books. You can pick yours up from the writer's block table at the back of the room. Before we begin, I would like to call attention to uh, BMI's upcoming events. The new edition of Witness will be launched Thursday. That's tomorrow. Yeah, way to go. Um, at Avant Pop Bookstore from 4 to 7 p.m. Then on Tuesday, May 9th at 10 a.m., Shearing Fellow Anna Q is providing a workshop in the BMI offices here. And a week from tonight, May 10th, will be the PhD Fellows reading at the Barrick Museum at 7 p.m. Yeah, it'll be the first time we've gathered together since COVID, and I'm so excited new experience for me. Also, uh, catch the last event of the season, a virtual event, Pitch Perfect, How to Sell Your Story to an Editor, featuring Heidi Kaiser and Peter Rubin, who, through their experience at Desert Star and Automatic, know how to do that. So I would like to make a land acknowledgment. With you, we would like, first like to acknowledge that UNLV operates from the city of Las Vegas, traditional homeland and unceded territory of the Nuwuvi or the Muwapa Band of Paiute people. We encourage everyone in this space to engage in shared stewardship of the land in active learning about historical realities of colonialism and the indigenous peoples who continue to work and live on this land since time immemorial. Um, I met Sally Denton through her remarkable writing long before I met her in person. And I am so fortunate to be her friend. Sally has written nine books, including the bestseller, The Bluegrass Conspiracy. She's co-author of The Money and the Power, the Making of Las Vegas and Its Hold on America. Isn't that a tantalizing title? How many of you have read that book? Yeah. Um, these books have told the truth in the face of threat and imminent danger. The most recent of her books, The Colony, Faith and Blood in a Promised Land, is no exception. I know from personal experience that the threat posed by the feuding Baron clans uh, is real. For my father was assassinated in his doctor's office in Salt Lake City for refusing to comply with religious demands made by Irvo LeBaron, one of the clan's patriarchs. Sally describes a story of drug running, kidnapping, and a bid for religious superiority that spills from the deserts of Chihuahua and the mountains of Sonora into the United States. As New York Times book review critic Julia Sherry said, meticulously researched, 
Denton provides a testament to what happens when male power under the guise of religious conviction goes unchecked. And that is just one facet of this remarkable book. Sally's words, however, speak for themselves, and she's going to read them, and you are in for a treat. Please join me in welcoming Sally Denton. Thank you, Dorothy. It was, um, as she said, we met, um, we read each other, I blurbed her books, she read my books, and um, when I was deep into the research of this particular book, I all of a sudden was into, I had no idea what I was getting into when I started writing this book, but all of a sudden I saw that um, uh, Dorothy Rulana Allred was murdered by Ervil, and I thought, that's Dorothy's father, and then I reread her books and found She's the 28th daughter of, 28th child of 48 children. And I was thinking, how on earth am I going to get in deep into this colony? And then I realized, well, my first phone call is going to be to Dorothy Allred. And that was back in 2019. And it led me on um, quite, a, quite a tale, as you'll see <laughs> in all this. First of all, I want to thank Dorothy. I want to thank. Um, Black Mountain Institute for having me. I have a, such a, a warm place in my heart for this place. It's where I wrote my previous book, The Profiteers, as a, a BMI fellow. Um, I want to thank Carol Harder, who brought me here to do that as a Kluge Black Mountain Institute fellow, gave me the opportunity to do all the research for that book at the uh, Library of Congress, which was just a stupendous um, experience. And the book went on and it won first place in investigative reporting for the from the investigative reporters and editors and it could not have been written without the support of BMI. I want to thank Beverly Rogers, who early on supported me and my fellowship and my work at BMI. And uh, it's just, it's really great. I haven't been back here since 2016 and it's just great to be here and I really thank everybody uh, for coming. I'm going to read a short, um, just because I hate readings. Um, I'm going to read enough of the book to tantalize you because um, that is really what this story was. And like many of my books, when I started out, um, when I, I got the contract, I first heard about uh, this uh, um, group of women and children that were murdered in Mexico. And I just knew that it, there was more to the story than the international headlines were um, suggesting. And I called my publisher and said, um, I think I need to take a look at this story. I think there's more to it. And man, was there more to it. I mean, it's really, as I've, I've told um, different um, interviewers, you know, if you get bored with one chapter, just turn the page because the next chapter is going to blow your mind. And before I knew it, I'm halfway into this. I've written two other books about Mormon history, American Massacre, about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and um, Faith and Betrayal, which is about my great-great-grandmother who brought the first piano into the American West in 1859. So I was familiar with Mormon history, but this was like I was starting from scratch. Um, I think there's water. I'm going to drink before I start it. This one is called, I'm reading from the prologue um, because it'll set the stage for what happened. The story itself, the massacre, and then everything takes off from there uh, into the history of Mormonism, which is in inseparable from what happened here and up to the modern day and uh, the fundamentalist Mormon communities in northern Mexico which, um, as, as Dorothy said, uh, seep into the United States. This is called She Was the Whitest. On the morning of their murders, the three young mothers felt uncommonly apprehensive as they prepared to leave the village of La Mora in northern Mexico. Their sport utility vehicles were packed for the six-hour journey, which would include a desolate 12-mile stretch on a dirt road dividing the states of Sonora and Chihuahua. 
Each woman had made the trek dozens of times between the sister communities of Lamora and Colonia LeBaron. They were all well aware that the isolated and unpatrolled road was also the regular route for Mexico's criminal cartels to transport drugs into the US. But because their interrelated families who had dual American and Mexican citizenship had lived in the area for more than a century and were well known by the cartels, they believed that they were protected from the violence of the drug trade. The lonely road was rarely used by local farmers and ranchers. Outside of the cartels, it was almost exclusively traveled by La Mora and LeBaron family members for whom it was a shortcut through the mountains. Sometimes they get the warning that it is better not to, be, not to use it. Bullets are, protect, are predicted, a family member said. In the weeks prior to the attacks, the victims had been alerted repeatedly not to travel the road, but for some reason they had neglected to take the threats seriously. I should say, because I, I think it's not in here at the start, this happened on November 4th, 2019, so just three and a half years ago. Each of the three women had an intuition that something was wrong, but they forged ahead, perhaps even knowing they were tempting fate. On November 4th, 2019, I did write that, <laughs> they departed in their three SUV, three SUV caravan, figuring there would be safety in numbers. Each of the women was married, and they were taking with them a total of 14 children between the ages of seven months and 14 years old. By all accounts, the caravan was unarmed. 30-year-old Ronita LeBaron Miller was traveling with four of her seven children. She placed Titus and Tiana, her eight-month-old twins, in their car seats. Howie and Crystal, 12 and 10 respectively, were strapped in with their seat belts, excited about going on a road trip with their mom and helping with the babies. Nita, as her family called her, planned to drive partway with the other two women and then veer off northwest toward Phoenix. Her husband, Howard Miller, was flying in that afternoon to Sky Harbor Airport from North Dakota, where the couple had been living for most of their 13-year marriage. Ever since Howard's brother had died several months earlier in an ultralight crash, Howard and Ronita had begun spending more, more time in Lamora to help in his parents' pecan orchards. Described by one account as a typical, typical American mom, the blue-eyed blonde had a Pinterest page and a frequently posted family photographs on Facebook and Instagram. Known for her sense of style, Ronita wore diamond stud earrings, willowy sundresses, and fashionable hats to protect her fair skin. A spunky lass, as one of her aunts described her, she had an infectious smile and relentless energy and could charm everyone. Just six weeks earlier, she and her husband had decided to leave the US permanently and resettle in their native Mexico. Howard had been reared on his father's large pecan farm at La Mora in the municipality of Bavispe in the state of Sonora. Ronita had grown up across the Sierra Madre mountain range in the village of LeBaron in the state of Chihuahua. At 16, she married Howard, her handsome 17-year-old second cousin, and now they were building their dream home on a hill overlooking LeBaron, where they would raise their growing family. Ronita and Howard expected to spend a few days in Phoenix, enjoying the city and shopping for a wedding gift for Howard's sister before returning to Mexico to begin the new phase in their lives. 31-year-old Christina Langford Johnson, the second woman, was traveling from Lamora to LeBaron with her seven-month-old infant Faith. Born in Lamora, Christina was the common-law wife of a native of LeBaron, a cousin of Ronita's named Tyler Johnson, and had been raising their six kids in Lamora while Tyler, like Howard Miller, lived and worked in North Dakota in the construction industry. She had recently decided to join Tyler and the large community of Lamora and LeBaron relatives living in and around Williston, North Dakota. Though she loved raising their children in Lamora, in the country surrounded by high definition views of uninterrupted landscape, they missed living together. That weekend, her family had held a going away party for her in the home where she had grown up. The next day, she was heading to LeBaron, where she and Tyler would begin the process of moving, moving their family to the US. A lively brunette with warm chocolate eyes, Christina was a gifted pianist and composer. Her late father, Dan Langford, had been the founder 
of Lamora, and Christina was a fireball who had her dad's temper. She reacted instantly to everything according to her mother. She could fight with somebody, but then a minute later, she was completely repentant and fixing it. Determined and focused, Christina was very disciplined, and yet she was sunshine. Every time you see her, she had a smile, said her mother. 43-year-old Donna Ray Langford would drive the third SUV in the convoy. The oldest of 49 children, Donna was like a second mother to her younger siblings and was beloved by the many sisters and mothers she supported as they reared their own large broods. Fun-loving and mischievous, she was known as Aunt Donna to dozens in the Lamora community who frequently sought her open smile and sage advice. Donna could take mundane happenings and turn them into stories with a moral, according to one relative, even if it might mean exaggerating or bending the facts a tad. The plural wife of David Langford, Donna was looking forward to celebrating their 25th anniversary a week later. She was taking nine of their 13 children, ranging in age from nine months to 14 years, to LeBaron to attend a wedding and have playtime with their many cousins. Ronita, Christina, and Donna we're all, we're all raised in polygamous families, model people, a close relative said, God-fearing women, committed to rearing good children. They were, ra they were related by blood and marriage and had just celebrated together in Lamora to wish Christina Godspeed in her new life in North Dakota. On the morning of November 4th, a Monday, the three assembled at the home of Christina's mother, Amelia, to load their Chevrolet Suburbans. Suburbans. They packed snacks and toys and puzzles for the children, milk bottles for the babies, and in Ronita's case, infant seats for the twins, as well as strollers and overnight bags for her visit to Phoenix with Howard. We were at my house and everyone left at the farm gathered to say goodbye, Amelia later told a BBC reporter. We talked about it, about how stupid we are as women traveling these roads alone and with our kids. Christina had laughed and said, I'm not afraid of anything, though she then added, I am a little bit, but why should I be? There's a bunch of us going together. I won't be alone. The women traded tales about the Sicarios, the cartel's hired killers who manned the checkpoints between the two Mexican states. We had been a little more nervous the last couple of months, Ronita's sister-in-law would remember, but we still felt like we were okay. Ronita was as knowledgeable as anyone about the intensifying violence in the region, but she was naively optimistic about her trip and her immunity from it. She had been born and raised in LeBaron. Her mother, Bathsheba Shalom, known as Shalom, was one of her father's four plural wives. The six of Shalom's 12 children, Ronita had bounced back and forth across the Sierra Madre range her entire life. She thought her innocence would protect her, her sister said. Who's going to mess with a woman and her kids? Nobody is that evil. Still, Ronita paused before leaving Lamora that morning. I have a bad feeling about this, she told her mother-in-law, Loretta, who later said they had all talked about security concerns the previous night. Maybe I shouldn't go. But then she slid into the front seat of her SUV. Under a clear sky, the 17 women and children struck out across the high desert, but just five, five miles outside of Lamora, a ball bearing on the front passenger wheel failed on Ronita's black SUV. They couldn't call for help because the cell service was out for some unknown reason. So Ronita and her four children crowded into the other two vehicles and headed back to her in-laws house for a replacement vehicle. Do you think it's a sign, Ronita asked Loretta when they arrived back in Lamora? Well, you have to decide, Loretta said, but if you want to borrow my car, you're welcome to. It was already after 9 a.m. and Christina and Donna, eager to get back on the road after the delay, headed out again while Ronita put her kids in Loretta's Chevy Tahoe and followed behind them. When Ronita arrived back at the broken down Suburban, she transferred the car seats and luggage into the Tahoe while the other two women continued on. Ronita then rushed to catch up. Not far behind her was her 18-year-old brother-in-law, Andre, who was bringing a trailer to tow the disabled Suburban back to Lamora. It was 10.20 a.m. when Andre reached the Suburban and saw a column of black smoke about a mile up the road and then a fireball exploding upward. Fearing that Ronita had been in an accident, Andre raced to the scene. He found the Tahoe engulfed in flames, the inferno so intense that he couldn't get closer than 30 feet to see whether anyone was inside. 
He saw half a dozen men dressed in black and carrying automatic weapons, and they sped away in new SUVs. He hurried back to his parents' house in Lamora, yelling that there had been an attack on Ronita's car and that he didn't know what had happened to her and the children. A family member sent up a drone to check the area, and men in the Mormon community gathered, forming a posse. They joined members of the nearby Sonora cartel, who were also assembling to investigate the attack. The Lamora community had long coexisted with the cartel that controlled Sonora, an offshoot of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's powerful Sinaloa cartel. In an arrangement more forced than agreed upon, the two sides maintained a largely peaceful, uncomfortable arrangement. The cartel members had heard the explosion and immediately suspected that their rival, La Lina, the enforcement wing of the Juarez cartel in Chihuahua, had encroached into their territory. Sonora foot, foot soldiers, 50 or 60 of them, armed to the teeth, loaded into a convoy of six hard trucks, tritons with blacked out windows, and raced off toward the site of the ambush with the Mormon men following. The family stopped at the still smoldering Tahoe while the cartel men continued up the road to confront the attackers. Kenneth Miller, Ronita's father-in-law, was the first to look inside the incinerated car. He recorded a cell phone video choking up in anguish. This is for the record. Nita and, my, and four of my grandchildren are burnt and shot up, he cried. The video would go viral as family members posted it to Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter in urgent pleas for help. They were still unable to get cell service, so they used portable Wi-Fi devices and satellite phones. They just shot the shit out of my grandchildren, my daughter's daughter-in-law, just burned them to a crisp, said a family member in a voice message shared among relatives in Mexico and the US. There's nothing left, just a few bones. Ronita's sister-in-law would later describe the horror to NBC News. It was awful seeing the babies, little skulls, just sitting there on the floor of the car, burnt and broken. Another relative recounted the grisly attack on the Chevy Tahoe. They just unleashed hell on this vehicle, fired shots, raided them, and burned the passengers alive. The front passenger door was open, and the ashen remains of 12-year-old Howie were falling half out of the vehicle as though he had been trying to escape. The twins' car seats were belted in the second row, and Crystal's burn body was in a fetal position in the SUV's third row, tightly holding on to a tiny pink leather purse. Relatives of Christina and Donna began to panic as neither woman had been heard from since they left Lamora two hours earlier. Family members frantically called the U.S. Embassy, the Mexican Federal Police, the Attorneys General of both Sonora and Chihuahua, and the Mexican military, begging for help to rescue the other two women and ten children. Christina had been in the lead as the road narrowed and began its steep incline, with a sheer mountain face to the left and a vertical drop-off to the right. The location, the location seemed chosen for its vulnerability. An attack could not be defended or escaped. As the women barreled up the road, their vehicles were easy targets. Sometime after 11 a.m., gunmen opened fire on Christina's Suburban. She quickly placed Faith, who was in a car seat on the floor behind her, threw a blanket over the baby and jumped out, waving her hands in the air, begging for mercy, and showing she was alone and unarmed. We're women, she shouted but the assailants kept shooting and she was fatally wounded in the heart. A few minutes later, when Donna came upon Christina's body in the road, she started yelling at her nine children to drop to the floor and hide the babies. Get down right now, she screamed, while also praying to the Lord and trying to start the car up to get out of there, her 13-year-old son, Devin, later recalled. Bullets rained from a nearby hilltop, killing Donna, along with her 11-year-old and two-year-old sons. A late model red pickup truck drove up to Donna's Suburban, and the driver told the surviving seven kids to run. Nearly all of them, including a toddler and an infant, were bleeding from gunshot wounds. Although the driver of the truck spoke Spanish, Devin, who was uninjured, understood what they were being told to do. They got us out of the car, and then they drove off. The driver was checking to make sure the women were dead, he said, and was surprised to find that the vehicle, were full of children. The vehicle was full of children. Devin gathered his six siblings and began the trek back toward Lamora, but they had walked less than a thousand feet before he realized they were too injured to make it. 14-year-old Kylie could barely walk with her foot wound. A bullet had grazed nine-year-old Mackenzie's arm and eight-year-old Cody had been shot in the jaw. 
Six-year-old Jake was uninjured but not able to walk a long distance. Xander, four, had been shot in the back. And nine-month-old Brixen, who had an open flesh wound in the chest and a bullet graze on his wrist, was carried by one of his siblings. Devin knew he had to hide them and continue alone on the long 14-mile journey home. In a ravine off the side of the road, he found a tree with low-hanging limbs and secreted the children under it, covering them with branches and begging them to be silent while he went for help. For hours, the children heard gunfire in the distance. By mid-afternoon, word had reached Shalom and Adrian LeBaron, Ronita's mother and father, who were running errands together in Chihuahua, that Ronita's car had been ambushed. Lamora and LeBaron are approximately 100 miles apart as the crow flies, but because of the rugged terrain and the single lane road, the drive between the two can take as long as seven hours. Departing from Lamora, the route first goes north and then doubles back south toward LeBaron, following the spine of the mountain range. Joel LeBaron, Ronita's uncle and a family patriarch, along with his adult son, Julian, organized a group on the Chihuahua side of the Sierra Madre to intercept and rescue anyone who might still be alive from the other two vehicles. Adrian joined the caravan of about a dozen people, but when they left Highway 10 to travel the 40 miles of dirt road to the Sonoran border, soldiers stopped them, warning that rival cartels were battling in the nearby foothills and the situation was too dangerous to proceed. Donna's six terrified children huddled together as the hours passed and the temperature dropped. Mackenzie finally decided that Devin had been gone too long and that she needed to go and find him. She left her five siblings under the tree and took off walking toward Lamora in spite of the bullet wound in her arm. But she became lost in the labyrinth of dirt roads and took off one of her shoes to fight back a snake, leaving her with a bare foot that was soon scratched and bloody from the terrain. Devin had, Devin had traveled as fast as he could at 5.30 p.m. Six hours after the ambush of his mother's car, the exhausted boy came across the search party, the armed posse of men who had set off from Lamora earlier in the day, and he gave them the first reports of the deaths of Christina, Donna, and two of his brothers. He said the shooters carried long guns and wore masks, and that Christina had gotten out of the car and waved her arms, but the gunmen shot her anyway. His uncles immediately headed out to find the hidden ch children. At about the same time, the LeBaron caravan that had been stopped by the military in the small village of Pancho Villa in Chihuahua was moving down the dirt road toward the, Sonor toward the Sonoran border. As family members approached the two massacre sites from both Lamora and LeBaron, a military garrison from Agua Prieta, 70 miles north of Lamora on the Arizona border, joined them. For 11 hours, frightened people from both communities scoured the rough landscape in search of the children, whether dead or alive. Shortly after 7 p.m., the caravan from LeBaron descended the Sonora side of the range, feeding local authorities to Christina's and Donna's bullet-riddled suburbans. They found Christina's body on her back 50 feet from her vehicle, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. The first person that came across the bodies, the crime scene, was me, Julian LeBaron later told a reporter, incredulous and outraged that no Mexican authorities had arrived to investigate. She was shot with her hands in the air. The group's despair turned to unfathomable joy when they opened the car door and found baby Faith, blood spattered but unscathed except for a scrape from shrapnel on her head. Still strapped into her car seat, a bullet hole in its base, the baby was soaked in urine and was in shock. She opened her eyes like, what's up, Julian recalled. It was a miracle, they all agreed. When we found out the baby was alive, it was just a whole new level of rejoicing, said her grandmother, Amelia. The starving and dehydrated infant cried through the entire evening. As Shalom gave her capfuls of Pedialyte she found in Christina's car, while others in the party continued toward Donna's nearby suburban. Donna's body was slumped over the steering wheel, so full of bullets they stopped counting. The bodies of her two young sons were also in the car. Around the same time, the group from Lamora arrived at the nearby spot where Donna's surviving and severely injured children, except for Mackenzie, were hiding. Cold, hungry, hurting, and scared, the children were desperate for medical attention and nourishment. The emotional scene became hysterical when the rescuers realized that Mackenzie was missing. 
As darkness fell, the desperate search ensued. Finally, Kenneth Miller and some soldiers who had escorted the Lamora group found her by tracking her footprints, which alternated between a bare left foot and a right running shoe. The nine-year-old had walked on rocky ground and through brambles for 10 miles, often in the wrong direction, bloodied by her gunshot wound and shoeless foot. When they found her alive on the side of the road, on the, side of the, road the men wept with gratitude. Another miracle. Back at the site of the attack on Christina's SUV, Shalom had gotten Faith hydrated enough to make tears, and the men took charge of transporting the baby to Lamora, where they would find a nursing mother in the community to feed her. With the rescued children being taken by ambulance to the medical clinic in Bafispe, Shalom and Adrian continued on to Lamora, returning before dawn the next morning to the site of their daughter's Ronita's murder. They were stunned that more than 18 hours after their daughter and four grandchildren had been shot at close range and set on fire, Mexican law enforcement still had not begun to investigate the crime scene. Adrian, a solid, deep-voiced man who had an authoritative demeanor, began searching the scorched Chevy Tahoe, crying and praying Shalom could not make sense of the heinousness, her daughter's beautiful life spirit reduced to bones and ash. Ronita's seat was reclined, her up and upper body completely burnt. It would later be confirmed by medical examiners that she and her children had all burn, been burned alive. The window glass and much of the car's chassis were melted. Next to the car, Adrian and Shalom, Shalom gathered shell cases from AR-15, AK-47, and M-16, excuse me, M-16 assault rifles. Adrian seized on the casings as proof that his community had been targeted that the attack was neither a case of mistaken identity nor accidental crossfire, as the Mexican government would contend. Also shocking to Ronita's parents was the evidence that she had been robbed and the vehicle looted before it was burned. Not trusting anyone in the Mexican government, Adrian and Shalom got into their SUV and drove five hours north, crossing the border into Arizona to hand over the evidence they had collected to the FBI, imploring the US agency to help investigate the murders. It was an unusual entreaty and American involvement initially would be blocked by Mexican authorities. All the conclusions that we've reached is that it was something that was premeditated against our community, Adrian told the Mexico News Daily. We know that if we want justice, we just have to do it ourselves and I won't stop until we get it. Hundreds of shell casings were found at the two scenes. They shot us up, burned our vehicles to send a smoke signal into the sky. This was deliberate and intentional, said Loretta Miller. We were the targets, we just don't know why. Of the three murdered women, none had deeper bloodlines than the immense LeBaron family than Ronita LeBaron Miller. Ronita's great-grandfather, Almadera LeBaron, had founded Colonia LeBaron which the family calls the colony. He was the patriarch of a powerful polygamous empire. LeBaron remains one of the largest fundamentalist Mormon communities in Mexico today. Adrian LeBaron, 58 at the time, told reporters he had four wives and up to the day of the massacre, 39 children and 79 grandchildren. She was the coolest, the whitest, and the most Mexican is how he described his daughter, Ronita. The beautiful LeBaron girl, as she was known, was born on September 15, 1989, the day before Mexican Independence Day, which Ronita treated as a celebration of her own life. She was sweet and a bit naive, a flower power girl. She gave birth to her babies at home. Going over that mountain range was no big deal. She was fearless and had a sense of invulnerability in her native land. Even though Ronita's seven children were born across the mountains in Lamora, where her husband Howard's extensive family had been since the 1960s, she aspired to raise them in LeBaron, and she and Howard had just, bought, had just acquired a choice piece of property for their planned dream home. Two days after the attack, Jorge Castaneda, one of Mexico's former, former foreign ministers and a noted scholar, told the press that Ronita was the primary target of the massacre. They had been marked for violence and they had certain frictions with the cartels and with neighboring communities. 
The LeBarons had received recent threats and family members regularly traveled with bodyguards, which makes it all the more difficult to understand why three women and 14 children were traveling unescorted. A family spokesman dismissed claims made by current Mexican officials that the attack was the result of cartel hitmen mistaking the travelers for a rival cartel. We've been here for more than 50 years, he said. There's no one who doesn't know who we are. There is one ominous signal to all this, and it is that someone has a bone to pick with the LeBaron family, wrote a Mexican reporter. The first thing that criminals aim for is not the target himself, but his or her family, usually her father or her husband. Months after the massacres, when it seemed unlikely that the Mexican was going to hold, the Mexican government was going to hold anyone accountable, Adrian LeBaron claimed that his clan was being persecuted, a word thick with religious meaning for millions of Mormon faithful. The murders spawned numerous rumors and conspiracy theories about the motives of the attackers, their identity, and the targets themselves. As months, as months went by without justice for the victims and only hazy information emerging about sus uh, suspects and arrests, each theory was more outlandish than the last. The attack on the LeBaron clan was shocking, even against the backdrop of the gratuitous violence of the Mexican drug wars. But in the long history of the LeBaron clan, it was, it was not a wholly unexceptional, it was not a wholly exceptional event. Any attempt to investigate or comprehend the murders required first an understanding of that history, which goes back nearly two centuries. The LeBaron story is not only an epic of pioneer America, but also a tale of secrecy, polygamy, blood feuds, conquest, and exploitation, wrapped in a radical, interpreta a radical interpretation of Mormon doctrine and steeped in a myth of persecution. Those feelings of persecution exist among members of the LeBaron clan itself. Ronita's grandfather, Joel LeBaron, was the beloved and martyred prophet of a Mormon fundamentalist religion called the Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times. Joel LeBaron was killed in Mexico by his brother, Erbil, in 1972 in a ritualized form of murder called blood atonement. The most controversial and fanatical doctrine in the Mormon faith Blood atonement is a killing of higher purpose intended to provide the victim with eternal salvation when his or her blood was spilled into the earth. Contemporary Mormon church leaders insist that blood atonement was a rhetorical device meant to keep church members faithful and that it was never actually put into practice. But numerous scholars over a century and a half have concluded otherwise. The LeBarons did not need to turn to scholarly accounts, however, the family had intimate knowledge of the existence of the practice. From the 1970s into the 1990s, the LeBaron family had been fractured by dozens of these so-called divinely inspired murders among its own. The modern day Cain and Abel story that began when Erbil murdered his brother Joel set off what US law enforcement described as the longest crime spree in the modern American West. It led to at least 33 and as many as 50 according to some murders on both sides of the border, and earned Erbil the moniker of the Mormon Manson. It was with neither hyperbole nor paranoia that some family members in the immediate aftermath of the attack on these three women and 14 children broached the possibility of the old blood feud erupting. It was the first thing that came to my mind when I learned of the massacre of my cousin, said a relative of all three women. This book is an attempt to answer a seemingly straightforward question. Who are the LeBarons? And what drove them first to settle in Utah in the 1840s and then to colonize a region in Mexico in the 1880s as members of an embittered offshoot of a uniquely American sect? Put another way, why were Ronita, Donna, Christina, and their children on that road in the first place? And why were they unescorted by any men? But behind this question looms a more fundamental one. Although I am not Mormon, I am descended from a long line of Mormon pioneer women, beginning with my great-great-grandmother, who was converted in London in 1849 by a future Mormon prophet and brought her seven children with her to Zion by sailboat, steamer, and wagon train. 
Her daughter-in-law, my great-grandmother, made a solo trek from Denmark to Utah in 1851 as a nine-year-old girl. She walked from St. Louis to Salt Lake City, pushing her few belongings in a handcart. In the summer of 1887, my grandmother was born in the mountains of Utah Territory, the 23rd and final child of my great-grandfather, a church leader and prominent polygamist. When the United States granted statehood to Utah in 1896, requiring the church to abandon the doctrine of polygamy, my grandmother became illegitimate in the eyes of the state and federal law, an outlaw, an outlaw by birth, as one writer described what happened to children born of polygamy. Today, the colonial LeBaron is a portal into the past, a place where one can glimpse what it must have been like to live within a polygamous community on an arid and dangerous frontier. This book is an exploration of LeBaron, the place, and the family in an effort to explain the impulses that drove thousands of women over generations, including ancestors of mine, as well as Donna, Christina, and Ronita, to join or remain within a novel American religion based on male supremacy and female servitude. Many did not have a choice in the matter, of course, but many others did, and many embraced their patriarchal world. These women of Zion found themselves in an isolated desert, navigating the often mysterious complications of plural marriage. What was the attraction? Why did they submit then? And why do they submit even now? And then the book goes from there. <laughs>